In today's show, Regina prepares a rich, flavorful wild mushroom soup. Guest chef James Boyce makes a luscious cream of green lentil soup and a beautiful bow tie pasta with heirloom tomatoes. Find out the secrets of goat cheese production as Regina visits a goat farm in North Carolina. Another beautiful day in paradise here in Sedona, Arizona, and we have a wonderful guest with us today, James Boyce of Mary Elaine's of the Phoenician, another little slice of paradise down in the Phoenix area in Scottsdale, isn't it in Scottsdale? Yes, it is, yes. right on Camelback, right. right at the base of the mountain. Good. They call it the oasis in the desert. Exactly. So it's a, a great place to work. And so today we're making one of your creations. It's a cream of, of green lentil soup, which you usually don't see. This is an interesting combination of ingredients. Well, um, it's sort of fun because we, we use uh, the lentils that uh, is from uh, France. Mm -hmm. And um, what we like to do, lentils. put a nice mirepoix, meaning uh, the vegetables to enhance the flavor, mm -hmm. uh, celery, some onions, some leeks. Um, but the key is in finishing it. Instead of using the full amount of cream, we use half cream, half mustard. Oh, so it yes. imparts vinegar. And you can be really creative because it cuts down on the calories. Right. And it also in, in really increases enhances the, the flavor. flavor. So, uh, the previous night we, we soaked our lentils, about a cup and a half. And then I have um, a little bit of leek. So we're gonna use about half of that. That should be enough. And then uh, my... Uh, just a common onion, just common yellow or whatever you have on right. board. Right, doesn't matter. So what we're gonna do is take a little bit of oil. Into okay, our, extra virgin? Sure. Okay, and a little bit when we get further into this and the mustard comes along, I can't wait to share with you this little treat he brought along. It's fabulous mustard that we're all going to be turned on to here today. That's it. <laughs> and then we have a little bit of celery root. Okay, now tell gonna... us what the celery root is all about in this recipe, well, what it lends. The, the celery root, uh, regular celery is made up mostly of water. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's very fibrous. Where celery root, it acts as a potato, thickens mm -hmm. the soup, so we, again, cutting down on the, the cream. So what I do is I take the celery so we can leave it in the soup instead of taking it out when we strain this. I just need a little pepper. Okay. Here we go. Okay. And uh, Regina, if you want to get me a little salt over there, and we'll throw it, it's in a little dish. Season that up. Very important that you season anything that you're going to cook a while at the first part. Not too much, but just enough to impart the flavor into it. Okay. So we're going to sweat this down or make them soft. And so about how long will this take? Oh, uh, three to five minutes. But you don't want any color on it. That's important. We just want to get everything it up. to soften up, get that opaque color. Very good. And then we'll go on to the next stage as soon as that's softened up. As you can see, we've got a nice melting pot of vegetables. Okay. And that's what we're looking for. Not too much color, if any. Right. And, just... that's, what, and that's hard because, you know, Good one second, you turn around, you mm -hmm. do something else, and there you go. <laughs> so I'm going to take my soaked lentils. It's got a little water in it, so just be careful. You're never going to get it all out. And what's, what you're doing now is you're going to mix them in, stir them up so they're mixed in with the mirepoix. Season it again. Now, what's great is that uh, you mentioned we have a new ingredient yeah, here. Yeah, these wonderful So you can binders. use little sprigs of rosemary or something from the garden. But what we have here is a coarse sea salt with organic herb mix, which I tried before, wonderful. So we can just put this all in. And what's great about this, it eliminates the step of going fishing after your soup's finished. So we season that up. And we're going to add our water. About a quart? Yeah, a quart, quart and a half. Okay. And that you'll have to adjust after, too, because you're going to have to thin the soup out. Then we're going to bring it to a boil and simmer that. OK, now we're going to do the croutons. Well, so we have this no soup down nicely. Is no soup is complete without a garnish. So you have your leftover baguette from your lunch or whatever. So we're going to make a little, a few uh, little croutons, olive oil croutons, not the kind that we're used to. We're going to, um, we're going to saute them a little bit. So what we're doing is just cutting them up in nice little, almost squares. Remember, nothing's ever perfect in cooking. No, it shouldn't be. <laughs> we can all lie and say we never cut ourselves. Oh, burn. I've been in too many kitchens to see. That's it. I know better. But the drier the bread, the better. Mm -hmm. And you hear it there sizzle a little bit. And while they're in there, want to season them again. OK, so this is cooking, and this is fine, because you don't want to throw them in there and burn one side and then toss them over. So you want to cook them evenly. And keep an eye on them. It's just like when you're scrambling your eggs in your morning. You don't want to leave because you're going to burn them. So this is cooking. My soup is nice and hot. So we turn that off. We're going to add our 
cream. You know, is this half, half and cup. half, or is this half and half? I or used cream? half and half. Okay. And then we're going to stir that and just simmer it for a second. And then our secret ingredient. We're going to finish the soup. Now, what I do is take. I, I say in the recipe, what, a couple tablespoons, but my idea is, is that you add this to as much as you want. And what I brought was a little bit different than just Dijon mustard. You should taste it. I brought a Roquefort and Dijon. It is you so rich and oh. I tasted it before, but I'm happy to taste it again. So what you do is you put it in, let it come together, and then it's we're so going to blend that. And at the same time, we're going to take our croutons off the heat, and they're almost done, and we pour them into a little strainer going to absorb all the extra oil. I'll put this on low on variable for you. Great. So we're not going to take a bath in it? No, we're not going to take a bath, especially with it hot. Hot. Been there. OK. And we have our little chicken. And you can see there's. Oh, look at that. Nice and creamy, yeah. and you can smell the mustard that's all together with it. Oh, you can. Nice touch. That, that's something original. I haven't seen that And then what you would before. do is take this out for your guests, uh -huh. and then sprinkle on a few croutons just at the very end, Ooh, and lovely. maybe garnish it with your little bit of Absolutely fried ro uh, rosemary. Ooh, OK. Well, we're going to be setting up for the next recipe in just a moment. It'll give the crew a chance, if you guys are interested, in tasting this soup. And what are we making when we come back? I brought uh, some heirloom tomatoes from the local farmer down in uh, Arizona. And we're going to toss it with a little bow tie pasta and goat cheese. Today's smoothie is about the digestive system. Now, if you've ever found that your stomach's in a general state of upset and it's gotten all out of balance, one way you can balance it back out again is by eating fresh papaya. Here we're using a strawberry papaya, but you can use any papaya you can get your hands on. Now, we're going to get to another option in just a moment, but let's first start putting together the uh, list of ingredients here. We'll start with the papaya. This is a, a tropical smoothie. We're using papaya and fresh mango, and again, if you can find these frozen, that's fine as well. That might be a little easier for you, in fact. And then we're going to cover the fruit with a fruit juice, and you can use anything except a citrus in this one. This is just a combination of fruit juices. I like to use just a little bit of lemon, fresh lemon juice in here, just to give it a little bit of kick, since it is a more astringent type of, type of smoothie without the milks in it and so on. And then finally, we'll give it a little bit of texture and smoothness from a very ripe banana, so it has high sugar content. Finally, also for the digestive tract, a little bit of yogurt. And we only want about a quarter of a cup. We don't want this to get too tart on us. And the sweetener today is going to be fructose. As I've explained, it doesn't spike your insulin levels quite as badly as some of the other forms of sugar out there. And also, it doesn't distort the flavor of this particular smoothie, which is all very delicate tropical fruits. A little different than if you're using nuts and bananas and all. And we'll add a few ice cubes to this. And then the final ingredient, which I'll touch on very briefly, are digestive enzymes. And you can find them in liquid form. You can find them in powdered form. Here, they're in a capsule. If you notice, particularly, depending on the meal you're eating, the, um, whether you're having, for example, a lot of legumes in the meal, or your, your own body and the way it processes food. As you get older, sometimes we need a little bit more help in digestion. These really can help out considerably. Here, I'll show you. You can just take one of these. They're pretty tasteless. And just drop the contents into a smoothie. And basically, it does a lot of what your body used to do better when it was really, really young. OK. This one's pretty. I've learned to just pull out two glasses, because as soon as this little segment is over with, these smoothies are gone. The crew has them. So for you guys. And a beautiful tropical smoothie. James, look at all these beautiful little heirloom tomatoes, and you're going to do something really special with them. And tell us where we're starting over here. Well, I, I jumped the gun a little bit. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I took my tomatoes and peeled them, chopped them, tossed them in with a little bit of olive oil, and I'm drying them out. So I got a half a cup of uh, just OK you know, olive oil, nothing right. great. You know, large quantity. And what we're going to do is season it up a little bit. I have some uh, crushed, red pepper. crushed red pepper. 
I have some garlic cloves, which I crushed. And then what we're gonna do, believe it or not, we're gonna add some basil to it. Just whole, fresh basil. So we've cooked this about a half hour, wouldn't you say? It's yeah. dried out nice. We've seasoned it. A little it. salt and pepper. A little salt and pepper. We're set. Okay. So we're gonna pull this off the heat. Our oil has sizzled. You can see how our, our basil is crispy now. Mm -hmm. We've steeped it. We have a little crushed red to give it a little heat. If you really wanted to, you could add a fresh pepper in there and cook it, habanero, whatever one you like. I sort of tend to keep it kind mm -hmm. of moderate. So we're gonna, we're gonna strain this out right into our pasta if you wanna handle it. Okay, and this is warm still. Perfect, we, we blanched pasta. it off, bow tie, but you could use any style that you like. Okay. So what we're gonna do is add our oil, and you see it. Oh, Very nice. wonderful. And that's not a lot, that's about a half a cup for all those servings that mm. we're gonna have. Mm -hmm. Then we're gonna add our tomatoes to it. Mm. Season it just a little bit. A little salt and, and pepper. And here's the, here's the uh, uh, goat cheese. Okay. And what we're going to do is sprinkle this. And this is dried goat cheese. It's not the creamy stuff like you find. When you say dried goat cheese, what exactly are it's we looking air -dried. for? It's air-dried. Uh, aged some Parmesan cheese, a little bit of salt. If you could hand me the basil. Okay, there you go. And we have some beautiful arugula. So what we want to do is actually just tear this up. We don't mm -hmm. want to chop anything. We want nice big pieces. And it doesn't turn black that way. Either. Right, and this is a finishing herb. It's not a, a cooking herb. Then we're going to toss it. Mm. This smells great. And we don't want to put a lot of cheese because it'll clump, but we do want to have a little mixture in there. Looks like you have a good amount. Right. Not that you're certainly going to taste. So what we're going to do now mm -hmm. is we're going to dish it out, put it into a nice little pasta bowl, and finish it. And you'll see what we're going to... And this is the finishing touches. You see how we have those nice big leaves mm -hmm. of pasta. And so many people make the mistake of cooking them, and it takes out the flavor. You, you want to finish with the basil. And you can just lay that on there, nice and lazy, kind mm -hmm. of. And you see the nice chunks of cooked yeah. tomato. And then what we're going to do is actually take a little bit of fresh arugula. We want the bitterness from it. And just sprinkle it on the top. So it's almost like an, a salad with Wonderful. a pasta. And then you have just a couple little heirlooms or cherry tomatoes. And then what we want to do is enhance the plate by the outside by just laying these on there as a garnish so you have fresh. So any heirlooms you can come up with, any color, Anything. any variety. Cherry tomatoes we brought, Whatever's you have a couple nice yellow ones. Mm -hmm. And then just a sprinkle oh. more of the cheeses. So fresh and lovely. And for yeah. me, that would be an entree. That's it. You know, and a you, light if lunch. You, you know, more salad, less pasta, whatever you'd like. And then you serve that right away. And it could even be served chilled. James, this is beautiful. You can smell the aromas. And one of the real flavor drivers here is goat cheese. So we're going to say goodbye to you now. But in return, we're going to go on a little field trip to North Carolina to a goat cheese farm and see how goat cheese is made. And thank you so much, James. Oh, you're welcome. It was, it was a pleasure. OK, how many are coming in for supper? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on in for supper. You better get in there. You better get in there. Come on. Come on, get in there. Here you go, here you go. Good girls. We supply our cheeses only as far as I can drive in about a half an hour. We have a good population in this area that w wants the cheese, and especially the fine restaurants. We, we're very picky about who we sell our cheese to. Do you sell goat milk at all, or does it all go to cheese? We haven't enough milk to make the, che the, uh, the cheese that we have demand for. So we don't sell any milk from the farm. Mm -hmm. So now you make it from uh, varying stages of softness through semi-soft all the way to hard cheese? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So can we go take a look at some of your cheese? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's amazing how really very simple and rustic the operation of making cheese is, isn't it? It is. And this is the way it has no curds in it, except the, little, the last part. Um, I'm going to reach down and get some of the, the curds. Now this is what the curds look like. See, those are the milk solids. And that's what we want to keep. And the 
way, we'll go back to the animals. How'd you learn how to make cheese? Step by step. I went and got a book out of the library and started on my kitchen stove and have experimented until we got the kind of cheese that I, we're making now. Now, here's a typical order. We've taken the cheese and we double wrap it. Now I'm noticing here on this order, you have 12 logs of chev and some says dill, pepper top, rosemary. Mm -hmm. Do you actually add the garlic and, and the spices here to some of them? We oh, do. Here we go. We coat them, we roll it in the herb. For instance, mm. that one is rolled in rosemary. And this one is rolled in dill. Oh, it's beautiful. Isn't that pretty? It's so fresh. Then we've got another one that's rolled in paprika and garlic. Mm. Well, it's just beautiful. Well, I mean, thank you. looking at it, and you can actually see the herbs are still fresh, and it's nice to be able to actually see the source and know that this hasn't been sitting around for a month or two, that this is the real deal. It can't. We sell out every week. <laughs> Well, it's a soup kind of day. Now we have soup number two coming up, which is a wild mushroom soup with a dollop of Devonshire cream. You don't have to add the Devonshire because it has a lot of flavor in it, but if you can handle just a little bit of fat in the diet, then it's going to make it a little bit richer. And this is a very classically French type of recipe, as you'll see here. We're going to be starting out with a little bit of butter and sauteing all of the vegetables. This has a two or three part process to it. So we'll put the butter in and then we're going to add leeks, and onions. Start with the onions here, about a cup of onions, and then one leek, the white part only, cleaned and sliced. So we'll cook this down for a few minutes, just a little, once we get all of the butter integrated here, we'll put a little salt and pepper in, and just a good healthy, I'd say it's about a quarter of a teaspoon of salt there. Some freshly ground black pepper, and we've got some nice wind cooling me off and fanning the flames here, which you can probably hear. And a half a cup of white wine. So it'll take about three or four minutes for this to all sweat and for the liquid in the wine to evaporate and have a nice, rich tasting mixture here that is not going to be burned. Okay, this is just about finished and I've added mushrooms along the way. I'm using both common button mushrooms and then also in this case we're using oyster, but you can use any combination of mushrooms. It's nice to get some wild mushrooms in because you get a little more intense flavor. But the really intense flavor does not come necessarily from these particular mushrooms, but from the mushroom broth that we're going to make that goes with this. Now, you can use any kind of dried mushrooms and then you're going to grind them up until you get a mushroom powder like this. Now you can go ahead and grind them even finer than this because this is all going to be strained out in the end. And now this is going to make about the most intensely saturated mushroom broth you've ever had, which I think is the real key to this particular dish. We're, in addition, we're going to do a bouquet garni, which I'll put together in just a moment. We've got our mushrooms all ground up, and now the other element of this recipe that gives it a lot of flavor is the bouquet garni. So we're going to add a little bit of a twist to this recipe and put in some nice fresh chili peppers from the southwest. We'll crush them up inside just a little bit to release those seeds so we can get some heat in the recipe. And we'll put a little bit of rosemary in here, a little sprig or two. And here we have some tarragon, fresh tarragon, although it's been sitting out here for a couple of hours, so it's beginning to dry already, and some fresh basil. You can also put some crushed garlic in here. Really depends on what flavors you want to bring into this. This is a this is a fairly intensely flavored dish because of the mushrooms. So I think I'll go with what we have here. Okay, now the, it's just getting ready to boil here. We're gonna put the bouquet garni and the mushroom powder in about six cups of water. We have about two thirds of a cup of the dried mushroom. And we'll let that boil for a little bit, come to a nice hard boil, and then let it reduce by about a third. The broth has reduced and you can see it's a beautiful brown liquid. And what I've done is I've already strained off just to pour the ingredients through a strainer and then you want to transfer it back into the pot again and you end up with this intense mushroom broth. Then we're going to add the vegetables that have been set aside to it, the leeks and the mushrooms. And we're going to let it simmer just a little while longer, adding some carrots just for a few minutes, and then we're going to be ready to puree it. And we'll put a cover on to speed up the cooking process. 
While our carrots and the other mushrooms and onions are cooking, we're going to saute some wild mushrooms, a combination of wild and common mushrooms. Here we have some more of the oyster mushrooms and some button mushrooms cut up. And then I thought we'd have some fun with something a little, not just a little, but very exotic. These are called wood ear mushrooms. Very thin, extremely aromatic. So we'll just slice these up and I'll cut them into little smaller pieces. We'll put them in. Now the reason for sauteing these mushrooms, this round of mushrooms, is that these are going to be added in at the very end for a little extra texture in the soup because the rest of the soup is going to be pureed and we want to make sure we have some nice little mushroom chunks in there. Okay, and we have about one tablespoon of butter. Don't need a lot of butter, just enough to coat the bottom of the skillet. Here we go. And we'll take about three or four minutes to saute these mushrooms and then we'll be ready to puree, add these exotic mushrooms to the mixture and a dollop of Devonshire cream. Our mushrooms are all sauteed. Everything's coming together just right. And this all goes in the blender. There we go. And we want to grind this up until it's a very fine puree. OK, this is a really hot mixture. And you can see it's nice and thick. And we'll put a little bit of the fresh mushrooms on it, sprinkle them around to get some texture in here. So we have our pureed mushrooms and herbs, carrots and onions and leeks, and then we have the sauteed wild mushrooms in here for a little extra texture and flavor. And we're going to finish it off with a dollop of Devonshire cream, and you stir it around, and then you have a lovely cream of mushroom soup. Now we'll go to David Berkeley and find out what he would serve with both of our French-style soups today. Regina, let's take a look at the wild mushroom soup because it gives me a chance to suggest one of my favorite wines. But alas, I'm one of a few of a diminishing group of admirers of this wine. Its name is Madeira. Now Madeira is most interesting for a number of reasons. One, it comes from the island of Madeira, which actually belongs to Portugal, but it's closer to the coast of North Africa than it is to Portugal. After the fermentation, the wine is actually fortified by the addition of grape spirit. And then it goes through this unusual process of aging, literally a baking of the wine. The best wines are put into casks and they're aged underneath the eaves of the lodges where the sun bakes them very slowly over many years. Other wines are, wines are put into warm rooms called estufas where they're left for six months to a year at over 100 degrees. Now, the interesting result of this is that these wines develop this unusual nuttiness, a special tanginess that is resonant just to Madeira. Delicious flavors. There are four different varietals of Madeira. There's Circeol, there's Verdelio, there's Buol, and there's Momsi. Now, either of the first two, the Circeol or the Verdelio, would work with this soup. But the traditional wine is the Verdelio because it has this unique flavor that goes so well with most of these soups. Now, if it's a vintage Madeira, it's going to be quite expensive because by law it's over 20 years old. Look for a wine that says special reserve or 10 years. Much more reasonable and delicious as well. Well, it's kind of hard to think about eating soup when it's 96 degrees out as it is today here in Arizona. Perhaps where you are, it's a nice frosty Saturday morning and these soup recipes will serve you well. Until next time, sante. To find out more about Regina's vegetarian table, visit our PBS online website at pbs.org.